Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar, and a very happy Halloween. So today we're continuing our series of talks on perspectives on Galois groups. And we're very happy to have Sam Schiavone, who's talking about In Search of 17 T7, Explicit Realizations of Galois Groups. And Sam, is it all right if we record this talk? Yes, certainly. Oh, great. And feel free to ask questions during the talk. OK, Sam, go ahead. Great. Thanks a lot, Rachel. And uh, yeah, thanks to Rachel and Drew for inviting me. And thanks to you all for being here on this uh, spooky Halloween. Um, so today I'm going to talk um, about some work in progress, uh, which is joint work with Raymond Van Bommel, Edgar Costa, Noam Elkies, Timo Keller, and John Voigt. So um, I'll start off by giving some background uh, and then tell you a little bit about this mysterious group, uh, or at least a group with a somewhat strange name, 17T7. I'll talk about some previous work um, that other people have done in realizing Galois groups related to this group. And uh, then I'll tell you about our work in progress and our approach for trying to realize this as a Galois group over Q. OK, so just to recall, um, I'm, I'm sure that people recall this from the other uh, talks previous to in the series. But so the inverse Galois problem asks the following question. Does every finite group occur as a Galois group over Q, i.e., given a finite group G, is there a finite Galois extension K over Q such that the Galois group of K over Q is isomorphic to G? If so, we say that the IGP holds for G. Um, but we can actually get a little bit more information than just uh, an isomorphism as an abstract group if we choose a defining polynomial for this number field K. So let alpha be a primitive element for K. Um, so K is just Q adjoin alpha. And let M be its minimal polynomial with uh, roots alpha 1 through alpha N. Then the Galois group of K over Q acts faithfully and transitively on the alpha I. And this realizes uh, the Galois group as a transitive subgroup of SN. So we have not only just an abstract group, but a group with an action on the roots, which gives us a um, transitive permutation. So Kluners and Mala have this great database. And in their database, for each transitive group of degree up to uh, 23, they give a polynomial realizing this group as a Galois group over Q. Um, and here I've included the links if you'd like to take a look for yourself. Uh, however, there are two notable exceptions. Um, so neither 17T7 nor 23T5 has a polynomial. Um, in other words, a polynomial defining a field which then has uh, either of these groups as a Galois group. Um, and just a, a note on this notation. So this is the notation used by uh, this transitive uh, groups database that was um, created by many people, including McKay and Hulke. Uh Basically, the first number just tells you uh, what degree your uh, permutation group lives in. So 17T7 lives in, uh, lives inside S17. It's a subgroup of S17. Um, and the second is number is just sort of an ordering of these, of these subgroups, because there are finitely many transitive subgroups of any given SN. Um, so this group 23T5 is one that's uh, relatively well known. It's the Matthew group M23. Um, but maybe the 17T7 is not quite as familiar to some people. So let's talk more about this group. Uh, but actually, let's first talk about the group 17T6. So 17T6 is um, isomorphic uh, to the group SL2 F16. Um, and here's a way to see this isomorphism. So SL2 F16 acts on the projective line over F16 by a linear fractional transformation. So sort of the usual way that um, you think about this group acting on the projective line. Um, and this, since there are 17 things in P1 of F16, this gives an embedding of SL2 of F16 into S17. And the image of this embedding is what we call 17T6. So yeah, so 17T6 is not just an abstract group. It's a permutation group. It's embedded inside S17. OK, so that's 17T6. Um, and uh, so 17T6 has this interesting property. And really, I guess SL2 has this interesting property. So uh, suppose that you have a subgroup of SL2 F16 such that the trace map from this subgroup to F16 is surjective, meaning that every element of F16 occurs as the trace of some element of H. Then H must be all of SL2 F16. In other words, the only group, um, the only subgroup of SL2 F16 such that every trace occurs is the whole group itself. <clears throat> and this will be an important property um, later on in the talk. So uh, make sure that you remember it. 
or I'll remind you. Um, okay, so now that we've talked about 17T6, let's move on to 17T7. So as you can see at the top, this is uh, not just SL2 F16, but an extension of SL2 F16 by uh, C2, by a cyclic group of order two. So throughout, I'm going to denote by G uh, 17T7. And as I just mentioned, as an abstract group, it's isomorphic to the semi-direct product. Um, and just to think a little bit more about the structure of the semi-direct product, so here, C2 is acting on SL2 F16 by the Frobenius map that takes x to x to the fourth. Um, so it's the Frobenius map of F16 over F4. So in other words, if I have, you know, um, if I have the non-trivial element of C2s, which I'll denote by sigma acting on this matrix, it just raises all the entries to the fourth power. So um, this also embeds inside S17, and it's through this, this action um, given here. So uh, given a pair of a matrix and an element of C2 acting on a point x, y, and p1 of F16, we first apply tau to the, the coordinates x and y, and then we sort of do the same action that we did last time, acting by uh, linear fractional transformations. So this action uh, embeds uh, the semi-direct product inside S17, and its image is 17T7. So this is the group that we're interested in realizing as a Galois group over Q. <clears throat> so um, let's first talk about realizing 17T6 as a Galois group over Q, though. So this was done by uh, Johann Bosman in his thesis, Explicit Computations with Modular Galois Representations. And he uses the following strategy to show that the IGP holds for 17T6. So this is just an overview. I'm going to talk um, about these steps in, in more detail to come, but just to give you sort of a flavor of the structure of his approach. So he's going to do this by using um, modular curves. So what he first does is find an integer n in a modular form f a cusp form of weight two, such that it's mod, represent, mod two representation, uh, which I'll denote by uh, rho sub f, has some desired properties, which I'll describe uh, later. So by the modularity theorem, um, this is isomorphic to the action of the absolute Galois group on the two torsion of an isogeny factor of this modular Jacobian, so the Jacobian of the modular curve x naught of n. <clears throat> so what he does is he computes complex approximations of the two torsion points of this modular Jacobian with sufficient precision in order to recover a polynomial realizing this group as a Galois group over Q. OK, so hopefully that sort of gives you um, an idea of the steps. So let's talk about the first step. So let f um, be a new form, so a, a, a cusp form of weight 2 that's a, that's a new form. Um, and suppose that it, it has a Q expansion uh, with coefficients a sub n. Let h be the Hecke eigenvalue field, so the a uh, field generated by these a sub n's. <clears throat> Given uh, an integer prime L, or a rational prime, I should say, and a, a prime lambda of H uh, lying above L, there's a Galois representation, rho sub f, that goes from the absolute Galois group to um, GL2 of f sub lambda, where here f sub lambda denotes the residue field of the prime lambda. And moreover, it has the property that for each prime P, not dividing the level N or the prime L, um, we have these two congruences of the trace and the determinants. So this is really telling you something about the minimal polynomial or the characteristic polynomial of, of Frobenius. So the trace is uh, the trace of um, rho, rho sub f applied to Frobenius is congruent to a sub p. So this Hecke eigenvalue that we started mod lambda, and the determinant is congruent to p mod lambda. <clears throat> So uh, we're going to be forming this field, this number field K, by looking at the fixed field of the kernel of rho sub f. Um, so this, the fixed field of K of the kernel of rho sub f is Galois over Q, and its Galois group is isomorphic to the image of rho sub f. So we're going to be interested in particular um, in two torsions. So we're going to take L equals 2. So if L equals 2, um, and we have a prime P that doesn't divide n times L, well, that means that P has to be odd. So that means that um, we have to have this, so this congruence that we had from before, so that the determinant of uh, rho sub f applied to Frobenius is congruent to P, but that's going to be congruent to 1 mod lambda, because, as again, we're taking lambda to be a prime above 2. So the Chebotarov density theorem um, implies that every element of the absolute Galois group occurs as some Frobenius, so Frobenius for some p, 
So this shows that the image of the Galois representation rho sub f um, lands inside SL2 f sub lambda because the determinant is always one here. <clears throat> um, so now Bosman does a search using a computer. Uh, so he uses the computer and he finds a suitable uh, cusp form f that has level 137 such that the Hecke eigenvalue field H has defining polynomial this quartic, and two is inert in H. So that means that its residue degree is four. So this means that the F sub lambda from, before, F sub lambda from before is going to be um, the field with 16 elements. So uh, as we saw on the previous slide, that means that the image of the Galois representation is a subset of SL2. Um, and by showing all that all traces occur, then in fact, the image has to be all of SL2 by this trace lemma that I mentioned when I was first introducing uh, the group 17T6. So it turns out that the subspace um, of weight two cusp forms of level 137 uh, spanned by the Galois conjugates of F is exactly the fixed space of the apkin laner operator uh, W137. So uh, Bosman takes advantage of this by computing numerical approximations of the two torsion points of uh, this, this uh, the quotient of x naught of 137 by, by this Atkin Lehner uh, involution and then taking the Jacobian of it. So this is some isogeny factor of the modular Jacobian. And then he does some, he does some more work after this. So he takes these two torsion points, embeds them into projective space, and then actually finds a nice function to map them down to P1. But in the end, he recognizes this polynomial, this degree 17 polynomial, which realizes, um, so this defines a number field which has as its Galois group SL2 F16. So Bosman did it. He realized 17 T6 as a Galois group over Q. <clears throat> so now that we've uh, seen how to realize, we've seen sort of like a roadmap for how Bosman realized 17 T6. Um, maybe we can try to use that to realize 17 T7. But the first thing that we sort of have to deal with is how to, what to do with the extra C2 extension. Um, because now, you know, the group is a little bit bigger. So one thing that you could try is, so Bosman used a genus four curve. Um, so he got an abelian fourfold when he took his Jacobian. Um, so you could try to use an eightfold instead, an abelian eightfold occurring as an isogeny factor of, of J naught of seven, so this modular Jacobian, by searching for suitable classical modular forms. But an eight-dimensional abelian variety is uh, it's pretty, pretty high dimensional. And also, if we're trying to follow his roadmap and use theta functions, that we're going to have to use theta functions in eight variables. And this is going to be very computationally expensive. So instead, we chose a different approach. So um, we tried to find a suitable uh, abelian fourfold with real multiplication by searching a database of corresponding Hilbert modular forms. So the database in the LMFDB of Hilbert modular forms. Oh, hey, Sam, what, um, quick question. What, what's the dimension of J naught N in this? Oh, in Bosman's? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure I remember. Oh, don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, I can, I'll, if, if uh, we have time at the end, I'm happy to take a look. I have his thesis pulled up. <clears throat> OK, so um, instead of using classical modular forms, we're going to use Hilbert modular forms. So first, let's talk about a little uh, background on Hilbert modular forms and uh, the action of, um, of these groups on pairs on uh, copies of the upper half plane. So let uh, H be the complex upper half plane. Let F be a real quadratic field. We're going to denote the, the two real embeddings of F by V1 and V2. Uh, let ZF be the ring of integers of the quadratic field F. And we'll say that an element alpha of F is totally positive um, if it's positive under both embeddings. So if I embed it into R in both ways, it has to be positive in both, um, in both these ways. So we'll define this group GL2 plus of F to be uh, matrices in GL2 of F whose determinants are uh, totally positive. So this will be important because that means that these elements will preserve the upper half plane when we act by uh, linear fractional transformations. So we can use the two embeddings v1 and v2 to embed gl2 plus f into two copies of gl2 plus of r. So this allows us to um, 
define an action on two copies of the upper half plane coordinate wise. So we have, so given a gamma in uh, GL2 plus of F and a Z in, uh, you know, which is a pair to a pair of elements in the upper half plane, we have this action. So it just acts by first embedding your matrix in the two ways that you can, and then acting by linear fractal transformations. So not so different from you know the classical case and the classical modular group. You just have two things instead of one now. OK, and also just as in the classical case, we have the notion of congruent subgroups. So we're going to define gamma naught of n to be the matrices um, in GL2 plus of, with uh, integral coefficients, so ZF, such that the lower left-hand entry C is in the ideal n. So here, the n is an ideal of um, ZF. So we can form the quotient. So we have, again, we have this action of gamma naught of n, since it's a subgroup, um, on the two copies of the upper half plane. And uh, we'll denote that by y naught of n. And this is called a Hilbert modular variety. And just as in the, you know, the classical case, it's going to be missing a few points at the cusps. And so if we compactify it, we'll instead denote it by x naught of n. So these Hilbert modular varieties are moduli spaces for polarized abelian varieties with real multiplication by an order of our field f. Um, and together with level and torsion structure. So the level um, is given by this fractor n, this ideal. <clears throat> All right, and uh, so just as in the classical case as well, we have these sections of line bundles which give us modular forms on the Hilbert modular variety. So um, suppose that we have a pair of uh, a weight, so a pair of numbers k, such that the k1 and k2 have the same parity. So a Hilbert modular form of weight k for gamma naught of n is a holomorphic function from two copies of the upper half plane to C um, that satisfies this transformation formula for all uh, matrices gamma in gamma naught of n. So it's, again, pretty similar to, I think, what you have seen in the classical case. You just have two things. OK, and maybe if you're not used to working with GL instead of SL, maybe this determined into something new as well. So um, Hilbert modular forms also admit Fourier expansions. Um, however, the story is a little bit more complicated. So we're going to assume that f has narrow class number one. So I'll denote the narrow class number by h plus of f. So what this means is that not only is um, every ideal in the ring of integers of f principal, but uh, you can choose a generator for the ideal that is totally positive. OK, so making this assumption, then we can write the Fourier expansion of a modular form f in this form. So again, it's not so different. Oh, sorry, this should just be n equals 2. So yeah, uh, you can, of course, define these things in greater generality. But here, we're just going to have a q1 and a q2. So here, um, just as before, so just as in the classical case, qj is going to be e to the 2 pi i, now zj, since there are two coordinates. And something that's a little bit different, maybe, is that this sum is indexed over the inverse different, or rather, the totally positive elements of the inverse difference of um, the number field f. OK, so we have uh, we have uh, Fourier expansions. They're just a little bit trickier than in the classical case. Um, and we can actually, so here we have Fourier coefficients that are uh, indexed by elements of this inverse different. But we can actually define um, Fourier coefficients indexed by ideals. So given a non-zero ideal in the ring of integers of f, then um, assuming that f has narrow class number one, we can write it as a multiple of this inverse different for some totally non-negative element nu in the ring of integers. So then we just define um, a sub n to be this element a sub nu. And one can show that this is independent of the choice of, uh, of nu. And so we call this the Fourier coefficient of f at n. So these Fourier coefficients are going to play an important role when we start thinking about the L functions of um, these Hilbert modular forms. OK, so I'm going to denote um, the generator for this. OK, so this is just a group of order two, right? F is just a real quadratic field. And I'm going to denote the generator by sigma. So um, if f, if we denote the, the Fourier coefficients of uh, a weight two cusp form f by a sub n of f, we can define this sort of conjugate Hilbert modular form f superscript sigma um, by declaring it to have Fourier coefficients. OK, so 
it's going to have Fourier coefficients that its a sub n is going to be the a sub sigma of n of f. So here we're just applying this Galois automorphism to the ideal n. Um, and I'll just note, because this will be important later, that conjecturally, so this is, you know, conjectured modularity, to um, a Hilbert modular form f together with its Galois conjugate f sigma, one can associate a pair uh, a, a prime of abelian varieties. I guess that's not really conjecture. You can associate a pair, but I'll state more um, precisely what I mean to say that like they're really they're really like in correspond to each other. <clears throat> All right. So now that we've gotten the background out of the, out of the way, here's um, here's our approach to tackling this problem. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to search for Hilbert modular forms f f sigma with some desired properties, which I'll uh, spell out in a minute. Um, then we're going to use an analog of the eichler shimura construction to compute the two-torsion field of the corresponding abelian fourfolds A and A prime. So um, this second step has some quite a few sub-steps, uh, some which are actually rel relatively complicated. So the first thing we're going to do is compute the periods of A and A prime by twisting um, their L series by quadratic characters. Next, once we have these periods in hand, we're going to construct moduli points that live in four copies of the upper half plane that correspond to these abelian fourfolds. And these moduli points will be ratios of the periods we computed in the previous step. Um, once we have these moduli points, we're going to form the corresponding period matrices, which I'll denote by pi and pi prime. And finally, um, just as uh, Bosman did, we're going to use theta constants to um, try to get this two torsion field. So we're going to take these period matrices and then evaluate theta constants with characteristic um, at, at, these two, at these two matrices. So our hope is that by uh, forming these polynomials in the theta characteristics, we're going to then be able to take these. So the theta functions are, you know, they give complex numbers as output. So we're going to form these polynomials and then be able to recognize these as elements of, um, well, rational numbers in the end, I suppose. The coefficients of this polynomial are supposed to be rational if we're going to realize the Galois group over Q. So we hope to recognize these co the coefficients of these polynomials as rational numbers um, in order to produce this desired uh, degree 17 polynomial. So again, this is, we hope. We don't have, I don't have the polynomial. It's not up my sleeve or anything, but uh, hopefully we'll get there so pretty soon. <clears throat> okay, any questions about the approach before I uh, dive into the steps? Looks great. Okay, great. Well, let's proceed then. So the first step was finding um, suitable Hilbert modular forms. So we want to find Hilbert modular forms F with the following properties. So we're going to let F be uh, its base field, um, the real quadratic field that we discussed before. And um, as before, we're going to let sigma be this generator of this group of order two. <clears throat> so we want our Hilbert modular forms to satisfy these five properties. OK, so we don't want F to be uh, the base change of a classical modular form. Um, we want the Hecke eigenvalue field H of F to be a totally real quartic field. So this is the field generated by the, the Fourier coefficients or the Hecke eigenvalues. We want two to be inert in H. So it'll have residue degree four. You can sort of see why this you'd want this because we are hoping to get something that has an F16. So uh, the field of 16 elements in, in, uh, in its definition. <clears throat> um, and we want H, this Hecke eigenvalue field, to have an involution with this special property. So we want it to have an involution such that if you apply the involution to um, this AP, which is an element of H, it has the same effect as applying sigma to this ideal P, which is an ideal of F, um, at least mod two. <clears throat> so we have these two fields, sort of these two number fields floating around, F and H. And this is really telling us that they have to interact in a certain way. <clears throat> Okay, and we want this congruence to hold true for all Hecke eigenvalues AP of F. And finally, um, we want every element of F16 to occur as an eigenvalue mod two. So in other words, so you can you can see this reminds you of the trace lemma from the beginning. So we want, if we look at all the Hecke eigenvalues mod two, we want this to totally cover F16. Okay, so um, we're gonna search the LMFDB for Hilbert modular forms of with these properties and we find 18 of them, and here they are, here are their labels. So uh, the first part of the label of Hilbert modular form, so this, this thing here is telling you what number field the base field is. So and this third number is telling you the discriminants of the field. So um, the base fields that we get are Q root three, Q root two, and Q root six. 
you have to divide all the determinants by by uh, by four. Some 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 tough math here. Um, so of these fields, the only one that has narrow class number one, as we sort of uh, as we sort of assumed to uh, you know have some of the results that we had previously, is this Q root two. So uh, while it's maybe possible to uh, deal with these other examples that have non-trivial narrow, narrow class group. We're going to stick to this Q root two, the examples with this Q root two to start at least. Um, and I'll just remark, so if you don't actually care about getting an explicit polynomial realizing this Galois, realizing this group is a Galois group, um, just the existence of, of these Hilbert modular forms is enough to give a non-constructive proof that um, the inverse Galois problem holds for 17 T7. So uh, again, so in some sense, you know, the, the answer is known, but it doesn't, this proof doesn't give you an explicit polynomial, which if you know who I am, well, that's that's something that I want anyway. Okay, so we found our Hilbert modular forms. Now we need to use this Eichler-Schmora construction. Okay, so as before, let F be a real quadratic field. Let F be a, um, a weight two eigenform with Fourier coefficients a n of f. And uh, as before, recall that f super sigma is um, the Hilbert modular form with Fourier coefficients given by this equation here. So you apply sigma to the ideal n that's indexing the Hecke eigenvalue. OK, so here's the conjectured modularity that I sort of alluded to earlier. So assuming that f has integral Fourier coefficients, then there exists abelian varieties a and a prime um, whose L functions are the same as the uh, Hilbert modular forms f and f sigma. So I'm not going to define, you know, the um, the the precise definition of the L function of the Hilbert modular form or an abelian variety, but suffice it to say that it takes into account it's sort of a generating function for these ANs or these APs, um, and saying that they're equal is telling you something about how the Hecke eigenvalues act and how Frobenius acts. <clears throat> okay. So to get these, um, to try to like compute these abelian fourfolds, we're going to have to study the uh, co the homology and cohomology of um, this modular, or sorry, this Hilbert modular variety x naught of n. So as before, we're going to assume that uh, f has narrow class number one, um, and we're going to let epsilon be a unit with mixed signs. So we want one of the embeddings to to be total, uh, one of the embeddings to be positive and one to be negative. OK, and we're going to denote just for uh, notational ease uh, by H, the second homology group of the Hilbert modular variety x naught of n with Q coefficients. OK, and then it's a result that you have this sort of Hodge type decomposition of the second homology group um, into four pieces. So uh, H plus plus, H plus minus, H minus plus, and H minus minus. And um, I won't give you the precise definition of these pieces, but I'll just uh, mention that these come from these two involutions of the, the two copies of the upper half plane to themselves. So you have one that sort of like conjugates, but then you're also multiplying by the two embeddings of this unit um, epsilon. And these involutions on H cross H actually descend to the Hilbert model of the variety X naught of N. Okay, so they descend and then we get this nice decomposition of the uh, second homology. <clears throat> All right, and so here's a theorem of, uh, of Oda. It's called the riemann hodge period relation. So um, let gamma S, S prime, where S and S prime are just elements, they're either plus or minuses. I guess you could think of them as plus or minus one if you like. Um, and let this collection be a basis respecting this above decomposition. So these are two cycles um, that sort of live in these respective uh, signed pieces of this decomposition. And there's some normalization, some normalization that you have to um, that you have to impose, but I'm not going to get into that. Okay, so we're going to define these periods as follows. So we're going to take our um, our Hilbert modular form F. We're going to embed it using the jth embedding of our field, and then we're going to make this uh, this two form out of it and integrate it over this two cycle. So um, if we define these periods, omega S S prime sub J then they satisfy this equation here for all, so for all embeddings. Oh yeah, I should say these are embeddings of H, the Hecke eigenvalue field. It's, uh, yeah, can be a bit confusing since we have these two number fields floating around. Okay, so um, 
this sort of tells you that re you really only need to know three of these periods, and then you can figure out the fourth one from the first three. OK, um, the next result, which is also in this book of ODA, is going to tell us how to find the moduli points of our abelian fourfolds A and A prime. So as before, um, let F be a, a weight two cusp form. And, um, and here, we're assuming it has level one. And we're going to assume that it's primitive. And uh, let A and A prime be the corresponding uh, RM abelian varieties. So with the notation as on the previous slide, then we can define tau and tau prime to be these ratios of these periods. Um, and these represents moduli points in uh, G copies of the upper half plane modded out, not by gamma naught of N, but now by GL2 plus of F, um, which, uh, so this quotient instead keeps track of, it's, it's the moduli space for isogeny classes of A and A prime of these abelian varieties. And for us, we're going to be, we're going to be taking G equals four, but uh, you can state this theorem more generally. Okay, so now we, um, if we know how to compute these periods, that tells us how to compute these moduli points of A and A prime. So now we need to think about how to compute these periods um, efficiently. <clears throat> and we're going to use this method that actually um, is used in the classical case. So it's in it's in John Cremona's book on um, modular elliptic curves, or at least this is an analog of that. Um, so it relies on this, this conjecture, which is sort of inspired by BSD. So as before, assume that F has narrow class number one, and let epsilon be a fundamental unit um, with mixed signs. Now we're going to take a uh, let chi be a primitive quadratic character. So from um, the ring of integers mod mod this conductor C or the units of that, um, and assume that the conductor is co prime to the level n, and that it um, it's generated by a totally positive element mu. So then we have this nice formula for this period of um, of f that we defined on, on the last slide or two slides ago. Well, almost anyway. So on the left-hand side, we have the period that we want. And then we have this sort of fudge factor that, uh, well, it'll cause us a little bit of trouble, but it's not, not too painful. On the right-hand side, we have a bunch of things that we can compute. So OK, we can compute the discriminants of the field. Um, this g is a Gauss sum. So that's also something we can compute. And then we have this uh, twisted L function. So we take the jth embedding of our Hilbert modular form, twist it by chi, and then take the L function. OK, and so we get almost what we want, this period, except that it's multiplied by some integral element of h. Oh, and I should mention that. So yeah, we want um, yeah the relationship between chi and these signs s and s prime is given here. So we want chi of sigma of epsilon to be s and chi of epsilon to be s prime. So um, as I mentioned, so we have this fudge factor. We can't quite get this period on the nose, but what we can do is vary chi. We can compute um, we can compute this quantity for multiple choices of chi, and then this sort of allows us to get an educated guess. So we're going to get you know various alpha sub chi's, and then maybe we take like their GCD, or we you know just examine the divisors of these various things, and then we can get at least an educated guess for this period um, omega ss prime sub j. <clears throat> OK, so um, now we have the moduli point, and we're trying, now we want to form the, the associated period matrix. So we're going to let um, beta 1 through beta, I guess I should say beta 4, of uh, be an integral basis of the ring of integers of our Hecke eigenvalue field H, and let um, eta through eta, okay, again, g equals 4, be the embeddings of H into R. So um, we're going to take our moduli point tau, and we're going to form this lattice. So we're going to take um, zh plus zh times tau, so um, basically, the four embeddings of H allow you to make make a matrix, which then you can you know multiply by you can uh, multiply this this vector tau by, um, and the small period matrix corresponding to this lattice is pi given by this formula here, where m is given as follows. So we take we take our integral basis and we're going to sort of we're going to um, embed these basis vectors as the columns of this matrix using all the embeddings. Um, and so that's going to be our M. And then D sub tau is just going to be the diagonal matrix with the tau sub one with the tau uh, one through tau sub four on the diagonal. So this is the small period matrix that corresponds to this lattice that corresponds to our um, abelian variety A. Uh, and I'll just remark that so uh, in general, you want pi to be symmetric and to have um, positive definite imaginary part. If that's at least if you want to get a principally polarized um, abelian variety. And 
So the first, the, the symmetry is not a problem. Um, however, there can be some trickiness that goes on if uh, the narrow class number of H is not one. So pi will have positive definite imaginary part if and only if um, each tau sub j, so each entry of this, um, this four tuple tau has positive imaginary part. And you can do this by multiplying by um, units with you know, the, right, the right signs. Um, if in, well, th you can do this if H has narrow class number one, because then you can get units of the, of the various signs in, in each of the embeddings that you want. So um, you can sort of see that the narrow class number is played, both the narrow class number of F and the narrow class number of H sort of um, plays an important role, or at least not having this condition would add, add a wrinkle to our, to our uh, approach. <clears throat> okay, so um, finally, what we're going to do is we're going to, now that we have our small period matrices, we're going to use these small period matrices to embed the two torsion points into projective space. So we're going to take a tuple of theta constants with characteristics. We're going to take really like sort of a vector of theta constants um, to define a to define embeddings of A and A prime into some projective space. And uh, we're going to consider the images of the two torsion points of A and A prime under this embedding and then form a suitable polynomial. And this polynomial will hopefully realize 17 T7 as a Galois group. So again, like I said, this is work in progress. We haven't quite gotten um, this step totally implemented, um, at least not for our fourfold. Okay. But we have made some progress. So using our implementation, we uh, reproduce examples from Lucina Dembele's an algorithm for modular elliptic curves over real quadratic fields. So um, Lucina is doing this just for elliptic curves. So this is, you know, sort of, we're trying to do a four dimensional abelian variety. This is just the one dimensional case. And in this case, we were actually to get um, even more than just the two torsion fields. We were able to recover the curves themselves. We could really compute the J invariant and even the C4 and C6 of um, these modular elliptic curves. <clears throat> uh, we also managed to reproduce a two-dimensional example, uh, actually maybe a couple from uh, Lucina Dembele and John Voigt's paper, Explicit Methods for Hilbert Modular Forms. Um, however, in both these cases, we sort of know what the answer is to begin with. So, you know, it's much easier to, uh, to hit the target when you, when you can already see it. Um, and one thing that uh, I've sort of neglected to mention is that this whole, this whole story of modularity really doesn't give you an abelian variety uh, on the nose, it gives you an abelian variety up to isogeny. And um, we really need to find the correct isomorphism class within this isogeny class to get the polynomial that we're looking for. So um, basically what happened is we computed um, some abelian varieties, but they were not exactly the ones that we wanted. They were off by some isogeny. And determining this isogeny was tricky. It took us quite a while to do. Okay, so just to um, give a brief refresher of our approach. So yeah, we the search, the searching for HMFs, that's fine. Um, and then the tricky part is just sort of this last step of using the eichler schremer construction to reconstruct the two torsion field. So we can compute the periods of A and A prime by twisting L series, that's fine. We can construct the moduli points, that's also fine. Constructing the period matrices is something classical. However, it's this theta constant step um, and also this finding the right isogeny step that is um, sort of holding us up and keeping us from finding the polynomial that we're looking for. So yeah, uh, we hope that we can solve these problems and then find this degree 17 polynomial that we're, that will realize this, um, realize this group 17 T7 over Q. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, um, the two, the, the big thing on our to-do list is this problem of, um, finding the right isogeny. So finding the right is isomorphism class within the isogeny class. So yeah, as I mentioned, the eichler schremer construction only produces abelian varieties up to isogeny. How do we find the right is isomorphism class within this, within this isogeny class? Um, I'll just mention that in Lucina's paper, uh, one thing that affects this is the number of real components of the elliptic curve. So he computes his tau, and it's one thing if tau has um, one real component, sorry, if the elliptic curve has one real component, and then you have sort of this factor of two that comes in if uh, it has two real components. So um, well, sort of the thing that you, you just might think you could do is just walk the isogeny graph of um, this abelian variety. But you need to know then at least the degree of the isogeny that you're trying to, that you're trying to find. So 
we should at least try to figure out what degree isogeny um, must we apply to get from the abelian variety we produce using this construction um, to the one that we want that will be defined over the, the right number field and will give us the polynomial that we want. Okay, and uh, so that's all I had to say. Um, thank you very much for your attention.